Good morning, everybody. It's Morgan Crosby here. I just want to give you another awesome update on what I've got going on. I am at the Canada Southern Railway Station in St. Thomas, Ontario, putting Ontario back on the map. This is the largest railway station that they had in the Ontario network back in 1870 when this was completed. And I just love to see all these amazing buildings that I can go around, given the nature of what's going on right now. Um, it's been very nice to be able to take some photos of my vehicle in, in areas that are not as congested and busy as they normally would. And this is a perfect example of it. So I've got my vet here. Again, I'm just in awe with the morning sunlight of all the cool lines that you can see in this vehicle. Every time I look at it, I find something new. And right now is the first time that I've had the ability to see the paint in all of its glory. So this is ceramic matrix gray and you'll see that there is so much depth to this vehicle um, in terms of the flake that's on it. And also you'll see my accent pieces being in carbon flash metallic that again, I've gone with a flake on both sides. Um, I also want to go through one more thing with you guys about a video that I made yesterday and that is to do with the windshield and it being a piece of downforce. I just want to clarify for you guys what I meant by that because it might have been a little deceiving if you just interpreted that all windshields are pieces of the downforce. If you stand right here on the vehicle, you'll see it perfectly that right here, the windshield is creating a ton of downforce. And on this current model, the wheelbase is uh, a lot different in terms of where um, the front axle is and the front windshield. On the old one, it was about 787 millimeters away from you that the axle was. And on this one, it's half the distance. So 16 inches further up front, you are on this model over the previous gen. And if you look, your axle right here and the amount of downforce is almost right on top of each other. Whereas in the old one, it was about right back here. So with the downforce coming in that angle on the previous gen, that's why why it's not a crucial piece of downforce whereas on this one with the weight being pushed down right on the axle that's why this is such a crucial piece of performance on this vehicle so um, I've also touched upon the aero pieces on it in the front in terms of how it can take the air and manage the heat um, this is the Z51. There will be higher performance models that'll have amazing cool features in the future, but we get a little bit of an idea of how they're gonna be managing that air um, in this model. So uh, the first thing that you'll see is in the front here are your brake intakes. So these are the ducts that'll go directly into the brake rotor and they'll come out on an angle onto this rotor here. And then you'll see that your rads are pushing out right there. Um, an amazing amount of engineering has gone into this vehicle and, and guiding the air in different areas. And to think previous generation Corvettes did, you know, a lot of things like having high wings uh, and stickier tires became common. But now that we're, we're getting into the, the, um, the demands on the, on the supercar market being so high, we got to, you know, really get onto the same level as all these high performing supercar uh, engineering companies that are out there. So just uh, again, an amazing piece of engineering that went into this vehicle. So let's get inside. Um, the vehicle and I'm going to show you a couple more things. I had a couple comments about this area and maybe using something like a foam insulation piece. So if you can imagine this being foam, cutting that and then putting it in there, I will try that. I'm not sure if that's going to work, but we'll, uh, we'll try it out. Um, being Sunday, I obviously like to watch YouTube videos and, and educate myself on, on all these, uh, awesome things that are on the vehicle. And, uh, one thing that I just, couldn't get over when I was uh, watching some videos this morning was um, in an interview that Kai did uh, he talked about how long it took for them to develop this this vehicle on the Bowling Green assembly line and the the first vet that they started to assemble with their team at Bowling Green it took them just under 12,000 man hours to assemble it and the uh, the amount of detail that I can see in their thought process when they went through this is very evident because of how many um, tiny panel gaps you see how everything aligns up I know that some guys in some of the forums were commenting that this uh, stitch in some of the models wasn't wasn't the best you know what honestly I, I can't see anything that would even be of a concern on my end here uh, given the amount of money that this vehicle is compared to one that's three or four hundred times three or four hundred thousand dollars or three or four times the amount um, the next process was the uh, first one that they put down the line and on that Corvette, they uh, they did it in just around uh, 750 hours. So the first time that it went down the line, it, they went and took 750 hours of, of man time to get it through there. They weren't obviously doing a, a ton of them at a time. They were actually building um, 
other Corvette models from the C7 generation at the same time. And uh, they didn't start doing triplets or, or three of them in a row until very late in the process because they wanted to make sure that if they did find an issue that they stopped the line and uh, they weren't having to worry about uh, the production of the C7 generation. So um, they were just very slowly integrating and that's why some people when they were trying to place their first orders maybe couldn't have done um, rapid blue or accelerate yellow because they were really trying to start this process of, of production in a very gradual manner. Just like if you started at Subway and some guy came in and gave you a, a crazy order with extra add-on of meat and, and different stuff, it would be quite intimidating. So it's the same process. Now the employees that were added on uh, for that additional second shift were also um, interesting. I was also interested to find out that they were not all just new employees. They were actually employees that came from different location. And given the news of, of there being plant shutdowns and um, also, uh, you know, a lower amount of shifts at other locations as they, they um, retool the Hamtramck plant, they shut down the one in Oshawa. There's a transmission plant in, in Baltimore that shut down. It was really nice to know that they took people from other areas and brought them over to Bowling Green for this additional shift and that they didn't just bring in people from the Bowling Green area. No offense to them, but um, I just think it's really nice to know that there was already an experienced line worker that was starting on a brand new generation vehicle um, off the bat and already had experience in building uh, vehicles for General Motors before so that it wasn't just a process of trying to learn how to build a new vehicle and teach someone how to build a vehicle at the same time. That to me was just, it could have been a recipe for disaster. So I was really happy to find that out. Now, in terms of the seating position on these vehicles, so the vet uh, in the previous gen had about a 9% recline. And on this one, it has a 17% recline. So that's another usability function that I just really love to see. Um, not that you should be trying to sleep while you drive, but to think that you can get even further back in your seat, that's a nice uh, feature for me. And then the last little tidbit to point out, in terms of how you can see in this vehicle, there's a 1.4% increase in your line of sight. So if you think about your line of sight starting out at your eyes and then moving up and down, you have 1.4% more space that you can see out of this Corvette over the previous generation. And the further you get away, the more distance that may be. And so in another video when I was talking about how um, at the stoplight, I can see uh, the stoplights a lot easier. I don't have to creep down and, and look at it. That That is exactly why, um, you know, that, that type of feature would be a benefit. Uh, last thing, I lied, there's one more thing. Uh, I did notice that um, on the vehicle, after watching a video from Chevy Dude, that there is no longer a pocket gauge uh, for your horsepower. The reason why I figured that out is because I was wondering why he didn't just look at the pocket gauge and determine what his horsepower was when he was um, when he was doing that YouTube video where he uh, when he uh, did a dyno test on it right from the factory or right after it came in from the factory. I thought, you know, why did, why the heck would he do that? Why didn't he just go into the pocket gauge? I guess if he wanted the exact number, he still could have done that. But uh, for me, it was really interesting that uh, on the previous gen, they had a really cool a uh, little novelty item to show you how much horsepower you're using. But then I got thinking about it a little bit more. And if you really do think the, do the thinking on it, you shouldn't be looking down to try to see what kind of horsepower output that you have at any given point. You should be focused on the road. And so maybe um, if there is someone on the engineering team that wants to reach out or comment, uh, I'd love to know why. And if I was right, that it was not so much to, to you know, keep you, uh, in the loop about your horsepower, but maybe keep you focused on where you should be looking and know that you've got a ton of horsepower in the back. So a couple more cool tidbits for you guys. I'm gonna continue this drive around and stay tuned for more. Happy motoring.